Today I want to introduce the idea of dynamic dispatching, also known as operator overloading. Um, the idea is that you have um, the same operation being used for multiple pur purposes. So for instance, as we've learned, uh, we saw how bind could be defined for um, effectful operations. Uh, we also saw so for the state monad. We also saw bind being used for the air monad with the false. Um, and we also saw it for the list monad, where, where we had this uh, kind of uh, join operator being used with map. Uh, in in these three uh, imp different implementations, they all are imp three alternative implementations of the same idea, of the, the idea of binding, uh, and there are three different realizations of it. So really, whether you're using the factual operation or the um, error monad, state monad, error monad, or list monad, it really depends on the object uh, or the parameters that you're uh, passing to. So you can think of this as, um, if you wanted to make it a bit more general, you would you could have a generic bind that would uh, dispatch to each different implementation according to the arguments. So if the arguments were uh, a function that returns an EFF, then you would uh, use the state monad, and if it were a function that may return false, then you could um, use error binding uh, implementation. And if it were something that returns this list uh, operator, then we could use it, um, the list binding uh, implementation. But why would you want to have um, a generic bind? Well, one idea is, so we, one a very obvious example is we kept copy pasting our macro so we had a simple macro and we kept um, copy pasting and changing ju just the binding operator uh, to let's say the, the error or the state operator. So specifically what I'm talking about is uh, remember this macro. Okay, so we can, uh, we there are multiple ways of approaching the problem. Um, and here the problem, or what we're trying to find is a solution to this problem. And I'm gonna show you a, a couple of options to do that. So the first thing we could do is, um, we can make the macro itself parametric. So we actually change, um, in this case, the algorithm that is being duplicated and generalize it. Um, so this kind of sidesteps the issue, right? Uh, the other way is you, you implement this idea of dynamic dispatching or you use it. So I'm going to show you how to do both approaches. And in dynamic dispatching, I'm going to show you how to implement dynamic dispatching and then how to use uh, Racket's version. Okay, so first let's look at um, extending the algorithm. So in this case, making the notation, the macro system, a bit more generic. So the solution is obvious, is we add a level of indirection. And the basis behind it, I can show you the code right now, is, um, is if you think about it, the problem is that we want to know, we don't know what bind is. So if, by adding a level of indirection, what we can do is we can add a, a structure that holds uh, which bind I'm gonna use and which uh, pure I'm gonna use. Um, so, for instance, I define this structure that has a parameter which I will provide the bind implementation and the parameter that I will provide the pure implementation. So then in my macro system, what I do is um, I give it a parameter which is uh, this M right here. And the M is a value of this structure. So whenever I want to do a bind, what I do is I do monad bind. Uh, so whenever you have an arrow, what it does, it has this level of indirection, which is M. And what I do is I look up the, the bind of M. So similarly, when I write in my macro system pure, what it's going to do is going to look up the pure operator of the struct monad. Okay, in this way, we made our macro a bit more general. Uh, so we can have the binds just as before. So these are all the the, the three monads. So first state, second error, and thirdly the list. Uh, 
and then what I did was I generalized the macro. And now, if I want to use the list monad, I just say, I just use it like so, where I just say, this is a parametric do notation, and I'm providing the list um, monad. So if I run it, let me... So if I run this, I'm running exactly this example, and I get, uh, this is the running example of the list mode. So I get the same output as before. Of course, if I provide the wrong one, let's say, if I were to pass uh, the wrong monad, then none of this would make sense if I pass state monad. I'll get something crazy, right? Because it's not expecting me to pass that. Okay, so this has to be a list M. I can delete this. Now in the second example, I just defined the state monad. And I rerun the example with the, um, the stack machine. I rerun it. And I see that it returns six and void because the final operation was push. So everything is working as expected, hopefully. That is convincing. Okay, so this is mostly one way of approaching the problem. That is, if my, that is to say, the part of code that was being uh, copy pasted was the macro. So what I did, I just generalized the macro. And I added the level of indirection, which is this struct monad. So let me comment this out. Okay. So in summary, I added the level of indirection. And what I have now, I have whenever in my macro, whenever I call bind or pure, uh, it has to look up this data structure to figure out what is the implementation of bind and what is the implementation of pure. Uh, and then we have the very nice macro on top of it that kind of hides away the, the ugliness of it. And here is the struct and here is the macro that I showed you before, really doesn't matter. You're not expected to understand what it's doing. It's more to show you that it is possible to do. Uh, and here is the example of the code. This is the list monad and the state monad. Okay, so the second option that we have is uh, by adding a type-directed uh, dynamic dispatching. So dynamic uh, is in opposition with static, and when th that is applied to programming languages, dynamic means uh, at runtime, when the program is running. Static means at compile time, just by looking at the source code. So dispatching, um, which means calling a certain function dynamically, so where you're looking up the implementation of that function. And type directed here is saying that it's according to the type of the argument that I'm going to dispatch the function call. Um, so what we can do is we can define a more generic type where we hard code um, the possibility. So if O1 is an EFF operator, then I do something. If it's an optional, I do something else. If it's a list, I do something else. It's another option that we could do. Uh, it has a few limitations. Uh, firstly, it, if I want to add a new operation, I need to change my bind operator, which might be problematic if the code is already shipped, so it's not possible to extend it. Additionally, in Racket, you don't really know the type of a function, so we would have to add a struct to wrap the effectful operation, functions, right? Because if you remember correctly, where is it? Here it is. So currently, it's just a procedure, right? So you would have to maybe check if operation one is a procedure. But of course, if you pass a procedure, but it's not really the procedure they're expecting, the thing wouldn't work properly. So it's a bit brittle. Um, but it works. I mean, it, it's a it's a, a way to do it. Uh, and here is the implementation. So we go back to the notation we had. Let me comment it out. So this macro, 
is the same as before, but now it calls the tie bind operator. And here is the code of, of the tie bind. Uh, but now the problem is that you have to, you know, how do you check if something is either a value or, or false? You can't. So you need to have a structure to be able to figure out if it's that type. So it's in, in racket is not very obvious because you cannot just do, is this an optional value or something like that? So you have to have, have another level of interaction in all the values that you want to check the type of say, so they have to have a unique type for you to be able to write this kind of co code where you can query is, is it the, is this a state monad? Is this an error monad? Is this a list monad? That's essentially what we're asking. Um, so in this second implementation, let me see if things work. I think it still requires. It needs a pop that doesn't use this notation. We just copy paste this very quickly. Ah, here it is. Uh, do, do, do pop. So he's complaining about pop. One thirty eight. There you go. Should work now. Okay. So what did we do? We wrapped effectful operations with a type so that we can check if something, so we have EFF op. And now if I want to do a binder, um, the only thing I, I have now is that my, before it was just a plain Lambda, but now I have to wrap it in a struct to know that it's a special kind of Lambda that represents a stateful operation. So let me show you that. Here it is. So this is the original push that just has a lambda s. But now I have to wrap this in a structure so that I know that it's the special uh, stateful operation so that it can be queried in this binder. Right? So it's, it's kind of a nuisance. It's not very, it's a bit cumbersome, whenever you want to write, um, something you have to wrap it in a struct so it, it's not very pretty to look at uh, but things work so you can use the same monad to to use the stateful operation but also the other one let me show you the other one um, let me see if this works Remove this. This one doesn't have a parameter. What else? Oh, there's no pure, so I'm just gonna do list. Yeah, okay. So as you can see, um, I used the same macro, and now um, in the first example, I used uh, stateful operations, and it worked magically. And with this one, I used um, list operations and it works magically. So if you look at the macro, uh, it's using this type based um, macro. And this is for instance, if you're familiar with Java, this is the same thing as doing instance of instance of and so on. Uh, where you want to check if this is of this type, then call this method. If it's of this type, call this method and so on. Um, you could also avoid uh, having uh, this this effectful op you could just do if it's a procedure um, you would call it but um, 
I didn't do it that way. Okay, so it's an option, but it's not very, you know, if you have another uh, kind of monad that also uses a function, then you wouldn't be able to use them both. So by, by wrap, the bottom line is if by wrapping, having these structs that can, that just wrap around something, you can have a, a new unique type to distinguish A from B, although A and B are the same value, but they're being used in different contexts. Uh, so this is the difference of bind, which is just you have to look up, again, a level of indirection, you have to look up uh, this structure to get the, the thing being wrapped. So you have to unwrap it all the time. And this is what's being highlighted in yellow. Um, and now uh, your pop needs to be a wrapped version of the original pop and so on. Uh, but everything works properly and bind works also properly. Um, sorry, the optional also works. So it's another way of, of, of approaching the problem. Uh, thirdly, uh, okay, so actually, let me go back. So what are the limitations? I already said that, but I want to just re, re, re say it, <laughs> or say it again. Uh, first of all, there's one thing I didn't say, which is you can't implement pure in this way. Um, you can't because you don't have enough information to know, which is a problem. Um, in, in the Haskell programming languages where, um, where you do have, um, you have a compiler support, you can actually know that by compile time, but because Racket doesn't have that functionality, it is impossible to, uh, figure out what, what pure to call for in a given context. Uh, so in Python, we, in Python, in Racket, we can't do that. Um, and additionally, if we want to add a new type that is also implements a monad, um, we wouldn't be able to do that because we would have to change this conditional to add another case. But if the code is already shipped, you can't change that. So you kind of have a, a, a problem there if, it, if that's a problem. Alternatively, you can think of it, this is exactly what I want and I don't want to change it, then this solution would fit. So there's another option, which is what I want to introduce now, uh, which is known as racket generics. And the idea behind racket generics is just that you have this implicit way of doing dynamic dispatching. And this is quite a powerful feature of, of racket. Um, you can think of it the easiest way or the, the most common example people use uh, these kind of generics um, would be, for instance, two string, you know, like all uh, objects have a two string. Uh, and if you have a functional programming language, you might want to have that as well. And with dynamic dispatching, you can add that functionality. So you have a way to register somewhere that you also want to implement this two string uh, function. Uh, and then the dispatching will call the, the right implement implementation for a given type. So that's exactly what's happening here. Um, so you can do it in Racket. It's this idea of, of generics. You have to import a special module. And then what you do, uh, in Java, this would be an interface. Uh, or in an object-oriented programming language, it would be an interface. So what do you do? You do define generics, you call it a name, and then you say which methods you want. So in this case, I want to say this is a method that takes a, sim a single parameter. Um, and then what I do is I define, whenever I define a struct, I can register, register it on this particular, to say I implement this method. Sorry, I implement this uh, generic, I guess. That's the name. Since this is a generic, you can have multiple operations, but for now we just are showing, I'm just showing you um, the bind. So how does it work? You have this special thing called the methods. And then you say, I want to implement, that's what the gen colon is saying, um, this particular interface or generic. So in this case, generic is called ty-monad. Okay, so it's whatever name I picked here. Uh, and gener generic, gen is just uh, short for generic. Not to be confused with C-sharp generics, which are more related to typing information. So it's completely different. So generic, think of it as just a Java interface, if you will. So um, in this case, I created a structure 
in this case the EF effectful operation. So this is one limitation is that you have to create a structure to be able to assign it or to register that, that structure under a certain uh, generic, bracket generic. So to that effect, the generic has to be defined beforehand so that you can refer to it. Okay, so somewhere, some someone defined this monad and defined a single operator there. Uh, and now I want to implement the monad and therefore this method. And I do so by doing uh, sh uh, sharp pa uh, colon and then methods. And then I write gen call colon uh, d generic. And then inside the brackets, I write one define per name of method. So if you can have multiple and you would have to define one defined per name being defined here. Okay, it's kind of a mouthful, but I do have an example. So let me comment this out. So what did we do? We imported the module, we created the generic, and we said that it has exactly one operation. Uh, and now we redefine the macro to use the bind, the generic bind, which is defined when you define the generic. Okay, so I define the generic bind. And in my macro, I invoke the generic bind. Similarly to what I did here, uh, right here, I invoked my generic, the type bind, which is the same thing, same idea, right? Uh, but here, there's a big difference. First of all, the first difference is that the first difference is that I don't touch dynamic bind. What I do is I registered whenever I define a struct, I'm able to register another uh, dispatching option, right? So in this case, I'm I'm adding a dispatcher for whenever the argument is an EFF op. Okay. And what I'm saying is that whenever I do, uh, I invoke dynamic binding of, I just define it for this case alone. And I do it inside this method. So it's not a public method. To be able to invoke dynamic bind, I have to call the generic one. So there is no, there's no, uh, gen uh, sorry, there's no dynamic bind for this particular EFF op unless you define it outside. But when you define it inside, that's what you're, you're just registering your own implementation, which is hidden away. So to access it, you just call dynamic bind directly. So now I'm just showing you an example. Oh, I need to uncomment pop again. Just a second. Okay, and finally I need to call. Okay, and it worked. And it worked. Why did it work? Because this do notation, so it's very similar to what I showed before, but two differences. First of all, anything you cannot control what is registered with the dispatcher. So in this case, dynamic this dynamic bind can be extended by any struct that rege registers it. Right? So the perfect candidate is to string where you want the code, you want that any data type be able to register itself as uh, providing the two string infrastructure. So that is pretty nice for that. That's when you want this uh, version that anything uh, where you have this extension point. Uh, whereas this version that I showed you, it's hard coded the options. So that might be for security reasons or otherwise. But uh, in this case, 
they they are they are completely different. So one is more generic, which might be a good thing, but it might also be a bad thing, right? Imagine you have code that is uh, highly uh, secure. You don't want anyone else to extend its behavior. Uh, by by using a generic, you are opening the gates for anyone to add more behavior. Um, but the the on the flip side, if you ship uh, the monad and the so the generic and also the macro, the macro will magically work with any data type as long as they register the the method. In this case, dynamic bind. Uh, yeah, and this is basically it. I just wanted to show you a problem that you could have, how to fix it. Um, basically, this course is also about uh, thinking about when you have uh, code repetition, how do you fix that, and trying to give you solutions. Uh, so I hope you had fun, and I'll see you Wednesday. <laughs>